Welcome. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. I'm Nancy Wilhelms. I'm the executive director of Anderson Ranch. And I have to tell you, we have such a fabulous summer series planned for you. We are truly looking forward to a summer full of conversations, ideas, dialogue, and creativity. I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors that make our series possible. Aspen Magazine, AXA Art Americas, Harmon International, Kate Solomon and David Wasserman on behalf of the Weston Snowmass Resort and the Holiday Inn Express Wildwood Snowmass and Valley Valet. So let's hear it for our sponsors. Today's speaker, Enrique Martinez Celaya, is a very good friend of the ranch and a good friend of mine. He has been a member of our board of trustees since 2009. And this spring, I was able to visit him at his studio in Los Angeles. And I was also able to attend an opening of his solo exhibition at LA Louvre Gallery in Venice Beach. And it was fantastic. Enrique is here this week, and he's teaching the first segment of a three-year mentored study program. And this is a pilot program that Enrique developed with us, and it is being hugely successful. We know we've created a model that we can apply to other program areas here at the ranch. Enrique's new book on art and mindfulness, Notes from Anderson Ranch, is available outside, and it is a compilation of notes and observations that Enrique made in nine years of teaching here at the ranch. So be sure to pick that up on your way out. Enrique Martinez Celaya was trained as an artist as well as a physicist. His work has been widely exhibited internationally and is included in the permanent collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the State Hermitage Museum, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Moderna Museet in Stockholm, Sweden, and the Museum der Bildenden Kunste in Leipzig, Germany, among others. He's also an author of seven books in art, philosophy, and poetry, as well as eight scientific papers in superconductivity and lasers, and four patents. Martina Celaya initiated his formal training as an apprentice to a painter at the age of 12. He studied applied and engineering physics at Cornell University and he pursued a doctorate in quantum electronics at the University of California, Berkeley. He attended the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, and he earned a Master's of Fine Arts with the department's highest distinction from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Enrique is a Montgomery Fellow at Dartmouth College, and he has received many awards and prizes, including the National Artist Award from Anderson Ranch Arts Center. Enrique. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. So, let's see. Today, I'm going to talk about two projects I have been working for the last three years. The first was an installation on Site Santa Fe, and the second comprised of four separate exhibitions. I look forward to taking as many questions as possible at the end of the talk. Artists like to talk about the how, the what, and the where of the work, assuming it seems the why is self-evident, though it rarely is. So let's begin this talk by making the presence of the why explicit by acknowledging that what is always being discussed, even if never articulated, is the why. Why hovers over every image, over every statement? Why is there when you confess your allegiances and it is there when you look at yourself in the mirror? Why on earth the worst ontological foundation reveals its motivations and its confusions and makes an argument for the work's relevance and for the artist's practice. Maybe not all, but a lot of nonsense, pretension, and ultimately despair 
would be clear out of the way if we as artists had a better understanding of why we do what we do, which is, of course, significantly more difficult than explaining the how or the what. Typically, one will speak of these two paintings remarking on some history, iconography, interpretation, and so on. In other words, the what and the how. For me, the collision of reference of those images with the material is a confrontation that presses the why against my consciousness the whole time I'm working and even when I'm not. Why paint this? Why use waxes? Why that edge on the boy? Why is he in front of the blue paint? Why is blue paint a sky? Why not swim in the sea instead of making a painting? Why not write instead? Why shouldn't it be a small painting? Why paint? In the end, the painting survives as it is through many changes as a response to that long inquisition of whys. More than any other attribute, a work of art is a response to the whys it brings forth, even if the artist is unaware of the questions. The perishable idea that is an artist is kept alive when we question our motivations and demand that the work be relevant in relation to those values and ideas with respect. Perhaps the art of our time is no worse than any other period. But the contemporary contrast between the enormous market educational apparatus built around the arts and the lack of ambition of much of the work we see makes our time seem especially dangerous to the idea that is an artist. The idea of an artist is not sustained by a veneer of iconoclasm or by wackiness, as many involved in the culture industry seem to believe. Institutions, galleries, critics, and collectors are now driven to uncover and praise novelty and often make claims regarding the revolutionary and challenging nature, nature of an art prop at a black tie museum gala. But these revolts are often little more than ornamental insurrection intended to make everyone feel less conformist, less dead. How could they be anything else? Through which mechanisms could an artwork challenge existing social structures and values when it is supported and praised by those who epitomize and support those very structures and values? Neither acceptance of the status quo nor notions of novelty and revolt against the current order make an artist an artist. Primarily, an artist emerging from a formidable will not to make shit. And one way to avoid is by asking why. The idea of an artist begins at the authentic gesture, not with minor insurrections, and authenticity depends on a love of truth, unsustained by bitterness, unstained by bitterness, or by the fear you're not enough. Not an easy fear to overcome in an environment where the main alternative to a status anxiety is cultural entertainment. In 1960, 55 years before we're already anticipating the current amalgamation of celebrity, entertainment, wealth, and art, Hannah Arendt wrote in her essay, Society and Culture, Neither the entertainment industry itself nor mass sales as such are signs of what we call mass culture, but what we ought to more accurately to call the decay of culture in mass society. This decay sets in when liberties are taken with cultural objects in order that they may be distributed among masses of people. Those who actively promote this decay are not the Tin Pan Alley composers, but a special kind of intellectuals often well-read and well-informed, whose sole function is to organize, disseminate, and change cultural objects in order to make them palatable to those who want to be entertained, or, and this is worse, to be educated. That is, to acquire as cheaply as possible some kind of cultural knowledge to improve their social status. Here, the criterion of novelty, quite legitimate in the entertainment industry, becomes a simple fake and indeed a threat. It is not only too likely that the new textbook will crowd out the older ones, which usually are better, not because they are older, 
but because they were still written in response to authentic needs. The state of affairs, this, the state of affairs, which in this is equal nowhere else in the world, can properly be called mass culture. Its promoters are neither the masses nor the entertainers, but are those who try to entertain the masses with what once was an authentic object of culture, or to persuade them that Hamlet can be as entertaining as my fair lady, and educational as well. The danger of mass education is precisely that it might become very entertaining indeed. There are many great authors of the past who have survived centuries of oblivion and neglect, but it is still an open question where they will be able to survive an entertaining version of what they have to say. This celebrity culture is an aspect of the environment in which we live, a big aspect, no doubt, and for some, all that there is. But there's also the mountains outside, the wind and the aspen trees, and also our lives and the accounting ledger of laughs and regrets. The questions that keep coming back to me, persistently and unanswered and urgent, are not questions of cultural production, trends, or crafts, but rather questions of life, of the choices we make, what has been done, and what is left undone. In the projects of the past three years, I have been considering the relationship between the small turns of human lives, our plans, relationships, disappointments, births, deaths, and the big turns of history, nature, and time. We're all aware of these turns, and to an extent we recognize that our experience of ourselves in the world is influenced, if not determined, by the interactions between the human and the cosmological cogwheels. In 2013, I created a work that brought forth aspects of the domestic as well as of the epic of the small arc of individual histories, as well as the big arc of time, to inspect those memories seemingly left behind, and through that inspection, point to those secrets inherent in everything, particularly in the familiar. The exhibition was called The Pearl. It transformed 12,000 square feet of Sai Santa Fe's gallery space into an environment that included painting, sculpture, video, photography, waterwork, sound, electronic fabrication, and writing, as well as my first musical arrangement. Although the development of the project was an intensely physical process that involved about 800 individual objects, I thought of the pearl as a poem. It was a poem about time, something touching on what will not be again, and sometimes inquiring about what is to come. The pearl was also an ending. With it, I completed a long arc of 10 years of work. That ending brought forth the idea of a journey of empires we make for the future and the markers we leave along the way. Work and ideas from this new project, The Seaman, have now appeared in three exhibitions as well as one upcoming in New York this fall. The work suggested by this new cycle is a radiant world grounded in experience, richer than what we can capture with our senses and secret, but without too many metaphysical, social, cultural, or cynical overlays. Undoubtedly, there is something biographical in this exploration of a journey. I have planted many themes, homes, lives, children, countries, hopes, and I have left many things. But my stories are neither the only source of this work, nor its aim. The images in the seamen draw upon my childhood in the Caribbean, for instance, but they also come from Nordic poetry, the popular Florida painting tradition, American transcendentalism, children games, and day-to-day -day observations. Initially, many of these images recall vague memories, but the first impression is usually superseded by the recognition of another, more robust order. This type of image unfolding also happens with the landscapes, we change from theatrical stages to intersections for memory, reality, dreams, and myth, as well as with the figures and animals that instead of remaining actors, evolving narratives, become pointers to conditions, placeholders, and mirrors. This aggression to the scene or to the reference in favor of presence is more apparent when the works are experienced close enough 
to notice that their scale and the way they are painted undermines the representation, the represent, many representational devices, such as rendering and illusions of space. A factor that contributes to the presence of the work is the history revealed by its surfaces. Since I'm interested in a search rather than a strategy or aesthetic consideration, I rely and ne ne neither rely on our sketches, pursue continued continuity of style, of style, nor look for peers or for common ideas among my contemporaries. The instinctiveness and individuality of this process leads to many failures, wrong turns, hidden images, and destruction. This history manifested in layers of pain, ghostly images, frayed edges around the borders, and also in the final conviction of the work, suggests that we, should, we could also think of the Siemens invocation of a journey as an allegory of art making. The surfaces of the paintings has an impact of an encounter with them, but the experience is also influenced by the way they are painted as well as by the images themselves. The scenes, for instance, seem convincing and stable only in one, if one does not look at them carefully. When considered with some attention, images become disrupted. The space is flattened by drips, the edges frayed representation, light is rendered as materials, and so on. This dissolution of trust of what one sees, which I find important in relation to indirect recognition, is specially manifested in those represented objects, objects whose optical qualities made them metaphors for the unknowable. Eyes, glass, water, clouds, for instance, are familiar, and yet our encounter with them often, often uncovers the unexpected, the unknown, in the commonplace. The paintings of these optical elements is by necessity futile, regardless of whether they are painted by Jan Davis on the hymn or by me. Even a Trump loyal rendering of light reveals itself to be a viscous smear of dirt when carefully inspected. But rather than a fault of painting, this incapacity to represent that which cannot be represented, despite efforts to do so, is at the very heart of what make, makes a painting into a work of art. It is also what gives a painting its strength and its tenderness. Art is truest when it is both convincing and revelatory of the artifice. Theodore Adorno writes in regards to these unresolved contradictions in the work of art. A successful work of art is not one which would resolve contradictions in a spurious harmony, but one which expresses the idea of harmony negatively by embodying the contradictions pure and uncompromised in its innermost structure. The painted image of, say, an, eye, an ice block is banal, yet radiant, affirming of the painted act and eroding of his conviction. Innocent is in, in his wanderlust, but untrustworthy. Art depends on unknowns and on the actualization of imaginings, dreams, thoughts, and emotions that are almost always poorly understood. Plato writes of the poet in the laws, it is not in his senses, but like a fountain, lets flow what, co what comes to him, and often contradicts himself with knowing whether the one or the other thing that he says is the truth. The new work I'm making now for my show in New York considers the idea of empires. Not the type of empires created by Cyrus or, or Alexander, though indirectly those two, but the other empires, the ones of everyday life, the ones built with the dust that settles on nightstands. Sometimes these empires stretch no farther than what we can hold and sometimes they reach to that elus elusive nursery of rainbows. Regardless of their size, empires are made of dreams. So there is a good possibility that in the final account, if such an account were to be available, these empires are nothing but reflections of our vanity. The tendency, however, is to postpone that recognition. Empires are always of tomorrow. Today, the wonders and frailties of the kingdom might be available for the wise to see but the wise are busy with their next campaign. Where have we been? Where are we going? These questions circle around, around the work and around me, and none of my answers seem good enough. I sort out questions in the work itself and by observing what is around, the choices I make and how I respond to things. 
I also rely on words and on text, my own as well as the writing of others. As it is usually the case, I have been writing while working on this cycle, and I have returned often to the poetry of Robinson Jeffers, Harry Martinson, Thomas Tranströmer, and Robert Frost. Where perhaps, perhaps is different about the seaman from previous projects is the significant presence of texts in the work themselves. I have written in artworks for a long time, but never as consistently and as extensively as I have with these new paintings and watercolors. Most of these texts have been written with the same lack of preparation with which I painted the paintings, which accounts for their immediacy and also probably for their awkwardness. In, the, in a way, the text suggests that all these, are ostensib all these ostensibly visual artworks are really poems, and a lot of the time that is how I see and approach the work. Finally, I would like to say something about the new book on art and mindfulness that I have been assembling and editing while work, working on this project and that in important ways has influenced the decisions I have made in and outside the studio. The book, which is primarily about mindfulness rather than about affirmations or findings, emerged from the notes Irene Sullivan took during the workshops that are held here at the ranch between 2005 and 2013. I took breaks from my work on the semen to rewrite, sort, and edit this book. And I often find myself challenged by these ideas. The cover has my name on it, but it is difficult to take ownership of what are ultimately promptings brought forth by continuing to ask why. Why made the work? Why made this work? Why follow this path? Or why not? Thank you for taking the time to listen, and now I'll be very happy to take your questions, which I'm sure will be a lot more lively. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I've experienced recently Lone Star at LA Louvre Gallery. And I've seen Site Santa Fe from your slides and everything. And it seems that when I enter your spaces that you want me to experience your total be being and you want me to bring my total being into your spaces. And I would imagine that you evolved as an artist into, into that manner of art. And I want to know what were the factors that took you from making one thing into making huge expansive things in many, many different media. Um, I began originally as, as a painter, uh, as an apprentice for a painter as a, as a kid, but I had other preoccupations in science and philosophy and literature, but I kept them as, as different facets of my life. If I felt that I couldn't bring them together. And as, as time went on, I, I, wa I wanted to create environments. I had a a wonderful dealer in LA when I first got there named Bernet Miller. And when we were preparing our first show together, he said, let's not make this into a picture show. Let's do something else. And of course, that show to me was still remains very important, although I don't think that many people liked it in LA when I did it. But um, I wanted to create an environment where, where, where the works, one work contradicted the other one. We, we tend to think of, of art, and we tend to think particularly of painters, as, as, as people who build on accomplishments. When you ask a painter what are their careers, you imagine a tracking of, you know, you, you work on something, you develop certain skills, or certain understandings, and you build on that and do the next thing. So I was very interested in building a career or a history of the work by working on the holes of what was just before. So building a career on deficits rather than on strengths. And in a similar way, trying to make environments that were not unified because the things looked the same. I never wanted to be a pair of goggles that you put on when you come in. I never wanted to be a product maker, that you know the kind of work I make, and I make more of that. I was trying to create each, each new exhibition as a new experience that I didn't know what was coming because it was coming from holes. It wasn't coming from the history or trajectory of what people knew. And I, I wanted some pieces to contradict the others, to put into question what was there. I understood and understand the notion of authenticity 
as a polemic, not as a place of arrival. And the work have to be that polemic. So when you walk into an environment, you're challenged, you're moved, because I am challenged and moved. And there's nothing for me to impart to you. They're not pedagogical or didactic works. There's no wisdom to impart, but rather they're an inquiry into something. And I want you to be participant in that inquiry. And the inquiry ultimately unfolds when you experience it, rather than when I make it. What are the questions you have? So the question is, why, how do I decide on different material and what materials to use? And um, I think that the, the, I'm going to try this as an analogy for the first time. Let's see if it works. Um, so, so when I, I have four children, so when with one of my kids come over with a with a question or a problem or a situation, as some of you imagine, what how often this happens. Um, there's not an a priori knowledge there. I mean, you, you know what, what you know, and, and you have dealt with other situations before, but you have to sort of figure out in the moment what's the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. And, and there's no decision, really. There's not a decision. I mean, you think about it. You weigh things. But, but you have a certain reaction to what is happening. And I think the materials I choose in the same way. I have a certain preoccupations. My writings is the center of the work. I do, I do some writings, and then somehow the, the encounter occurs with the work, and that encounter dictates how it's going to go. And very often, I don't have a lot of... It's by no means sort of a, a bumbling fool process, because I'm often, I'm often required a certain critical response to what I'm doing. And I'm, I destroy a lot of work, and I'm and I'm actively making sure that something has to survive because it must survive, not because I did it. So, so in that process, there's, of course, a lot of questioning. But it's questioning sort of after the fact. Um, and then, of course, there's further editing when I'm putting the work together at the exhibition. And some, and some projects, well, you know, be a commission or be some specific things. And in some ways, the architecture or the situation dictates the scale, for example, of the materials. Um, yeah. What else? Yeah, back there. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing with your class at this point? Um, so I mean with, with the class I am I'm mostly um, they're all practicing artists who have been working uh, for you know a lot of time, some of them and some of them for a significant amount of time. Um, and what we're trying to do is critiques this, this, this week. We're critiques in a loose kind of sense of the word. We're having discussions and we're having some promptings. And, and what we're trying to create is some, some map of how we're going to be um, moving forward for the next you know, few years. And, and we're hoping that a certain understanding of how we do that and what language you use and, and all of that is, is, is done. And I also try to understand where everybody is at this moment. So that sounds really vague. It's not so vague in actual practice, but... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you, thank you. Um, you mentioned the level of preparedness and the text that you include in your paintings mirroring the preparation that goes into other elements and contributing to a, a degree of awkwardness. And I'm wondering if you could speak to the role that the awkward plays in the works and in the experience that they create for the viewer. Well, I mean, it's interesting. There's nothing really rehearsed about that awkwardness nor cultivated. It's as awkward as I am giving that talk. It's just a condition of, of being as, as, as you know, I am in the front of you, and, and I want to, this thing to come across as well as it can. And trying to balance all those things in there result in some moments of terrible awkwardness and all of that. And, and it's the same way. So I, I'm trying to make sure that I am never an expert in my own work. Um, 
and I'm also trying to make sure that the work is emerging from a place that is unfamiliar to me. So when you put those two criteria, those two imperatives into your work, you necessarily end up with a lot of awkwardness. You also end up with a lot of bad things. Um, and occasionally you end up with some new discoveries that you didn't know before. So I, I, I don't want to sort of do and, uh, you know, sort of the Ansel Kiefer maneuver of, of sort of taking Paul Celan's incredible poetry and put it in the work either because it needs it or because it had gravitas to the work. I do not want to be winking my eye to you with some sort of snappy little comment, nor I want to sort of pretend that because we are using arbitrage and we are in the art world where a number of people would not have read so much, then I, you can get away with some really bad writing. So, so I want to sort of make sure that if my writing is going to be bad, is at the very least I am conscious of the fact that is, that is in a dialectical relationship, not just with our world, but with all writings that there is. So that if, that if I have read, read Martin's on Tolstoy, that although I am more conscious than anyone how far below that my writing is, that that is actually the dialogue. The dialogue is not with some sort of second-rate art writing. Yeah, back there. How do you balance the indictment you made of art and culture today with your success in that environment? Ah, the question that one dreads. Um, <laughs> not, an, not an easy balance. Not an easy balance. It's full of contradictions. So, um, and, 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 um, so, so to not, the, the question is, what is it that, that allows you to go back to the mirror and look at yourself and you say, well, I have, I made these compromises or I have this level of hypocrisy in what I say. You know, in all my studios I write, keep your actions faithful, the first thing before I do anything. And it's a Buddhist idea that what you say and what you do and what you think are more or less the same. And of course, that is very difficult. And I have a certain studio that I, I create my studios and spend a lot of time building them so they will affirm not my taste and my affecta affectations, but rather that they will be, show me how to be better, how to live better, how to make better choices. And I have my assistants engage, hopefully, in the, sort of the same practice. And I, have, I make my own work, no matter what requirements are external to me. And that does not mean that I find myself often in, in interesting situations. Um, I do find myself in interesting situations, but I, and let me say something. Let me pause for a second and move it in this, in this direction. Um, the reason I do this is not to try to be super ethical. The reason I do this is because being an artist or being anybody trying to do anything in life is often very difficult. Confusion is everywhere. And even when your mind is as clear as it can be, things are not easy. The choices we make are not easy, especially when, when the choices are between two things that are so close together. So how do we make those choices? And I find that, th that if I begin to trample on or smear the center of, of what I am and the center from which I make those choices, then I don't know what I will do. I'm, I'll be at a loss. So it's really less an ethical choice than a very survivalist choice. You know, when I left physics, I left physics because I felt I wanted to be an artist. There were a lot of, a lot of sacrifices that came with that, especially for my parents who were terribly disappointed after all these years of being an immigrant and moving around and so on. So, and I made it because I felt that this is what I needed to do. So I come to art not to apologize or trying to seem like it's so intelligent as a lot of art tends to do and so on. And by keeping my mind clear on why I'm doing it for myself and what is it that experience I want of it in the world, 
I'm able to, to survive this. But it's not, it's not without contradictions. And um, I mean, there are weekly contradictions. Yeah. Uh, I, think, oh, I think that maybe this question relates to the last one a little bit. But uh, this is a question I've been asking myself a lot. And so I've been asking other people too to answer. Um, and that is, uh, how do you define success as an artist? And how do you define success in the art world? Well, they're very different. Um, I mean, success as an artist for me is is very elusive. I mean, I think I think the only thing that su success as an artist tend to often be sort of some some hindsight understanding of where you have been, um, and I think the measure of success and the criteria used to define success have to do with sort of the honesty of the inquiry above anything else. Um, I mean, there's nothing you can do about your talents, whatever that is. And you do the best you can in sort of your intelligence and your education, but, but, but those, a lot of those things are, are sort of what they are. Is, is, is your drive and your, and your willingness to be honest with where you are and what you need and what you want that in some ways will define how fulfilling that experience is. Why you want to come to the studio, not because you got more crap you got to produce for the show or for this waiting list or for that person or for this auction house or for this fair, but rather because it still means something to you because you still, you're still find something viable of yourself in that experience. Success in the art world is, I mean, is something that it matters because you know you ha I have four children. It matters because I have assistants and I have to pay for. It matters in those regards. So it matters that we have some sort of level of of appreciation and that the shows do well enough. Um, but but really, it's such a fickle thing. Um, anybody who has been in the art world for more than 20 minutes knows that things go up and down, and this person is in the cover of the magazine next year, nobody cares. This person is hot, we was talking about, you know, all, that, all those things. Um, and I find it kind of gross, really, gross. Um, it, it, everybody, everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people pay lip service to, to higher ideals. But in practical terms, that is not what one sees. Not what one sees at institutions, and not what one sees at art fairs, not what one sees at any, in any way. And there are, of course, exceptions within that. And it's for those exceptions, are those exceptions that you look for, to not feel so isolated or so lonely in that process. And then you can then rotate that and say, well, success is to an extent having an assembly or a collection of those people who, who haven't yet thrown in the towel, and that you have some of them around. And if you, uh, maybe success is how significant those relationships are in your life. But, but it's, it's, not a, it's not an easy, an easy measure. Um, I noticed that the thing that I did not mention was the quality of the work. Because, I mean, how does, what does one know about that? Um, and essentially, the more you know, the more you have read, the more you have seen, the less impressed you're going to be with your own work. If you're really impressed, then you probably don't know that much. What else? What, um, let's take a couple more questions. Yeah. How often do you... Um, how often do you uh, have a clear answer to the question of why? Well, that's the wonderful thing about the question why, that you don't have to have a clear answer. You just have to keep asking it. You know, um, so, so, you know, in every choice, I mean, as an artist, you're, you're constantly in two spaces at once. You're, in some ways, in the moment of what you're doing. And you also have to develop some sort of critical distance from what you're doing. So you're in two spaces simultaneously. And, and why allows you to, to really discover what motivations are driving that. But those, that question of why cannot be happening in the act of being in the moment. Because if you do that, you pull yourself out of the moment. The why is the training of the critical distance which you place onto, after making that gesture, or before making that gesture. 
But when you make that gesture, you're, you have to be in it fully engaged. So, but you know, the why question has a tendency, as you all know from your own lives, um, has a tendency to, to become, a, if it becomes a practice over time, you do clarify things. Maybe today you're not clear on what you're doing and then why, but slowly, if you keep asking, things emerge. Maybe not the ultimate knowledge you're after, but some things along the way becomes clearer. Um, the how and the what tends to be so temporary because how you do something today will be different than how you do it tomorrow. Or ultimately, really, of no, they're descriptors. Most people talk this way. They tell you a story of, I did this, and then I did that, and, and this is how I do it. And artists have a tendency to speak this way. And people get inside those stories, and they seem so charming. But in some ways, there's something somewhat pathological sounding about the way artists talk in this way. And I like to do this, and I like to do that, and I like to do the other thing. And it's like, why would you ever want to do that? <laughs> and especially because the value of a lot of art is by no means self-evident. It's not that maybe you feel differently, but I, I don't walk around uh, in exhibitions and say, oh, of course you had to make that painting. Of course you have to make that sculpture. No, it's like, why would you ever want to make that? It's a big question. So, so then I think that for myself, I think, well, I have to be able to answer that. Why would you want to make this? What imperative is there? And if the answer is, there's not really any reason to make this thing, then you shouldn't make it. And by reason, I don't mean a rational reason so, so much as, a, as, as some other level of understanding of why you do something. So maybe we'll take one more question. Yeah, back there. <laughs> How is it um, having a family and being an artist? That's my son asking that question. <laughs> so, so I, I hmm. Um, it is a good question. It's a very good question. So, um, so, you know, I, I think that having a family, as, as, as those of you who have families, um, whether you're artists or not, um, is, is, is many things at once. It's many things at once. And specifically in the case of an artist, I think one of the first things that happened to me when I had my, my daughter, which is my first kid, um, is the realization that now you're accountable. You're accountable to someone else in a way that whatever lies you make of whatever things you do, whatever compromises you make, somebody else will either know about them or can see them breathing through you. Um, and in many ways, many mistakes I have made in the past and many things that I have done incorrect and I continue to make um, become all the more problematic in the face of of a family in the face of your children. So that is one, one aspect of, of having a family. The other aspect that you have to balance, I used to work 16 or 17 hours a day, um, but you can't do that, or I, I cannot do that with four children. So I spend time with them. You always feel like you're not spending enough time with the family, you're not spending enough time with your work, and then you have to resolve that polemic within yourself. It's never, it never feels great. You always feel like, Everybody's getting shortchanged in some way. Um, and then the, the other way, I think, is that there is something, and this is not just as an artist, I mean, and there is something undeniable about your children or my children <coughs> that few things in life, and particularly in the art world, have that undeniability. So everything in my regular world as an artist is somewhat relative. You know, whether the appreciation of some people or, or the questions of the art world or the decisions or the fights you have with individuals or all that, all that is always moving up and down like the sea. But there's some, some, something very um, absolute about encountering with my children, which becomes some sort of beacon um, 
in the rest of my experiences as an artist. Um, and for that, I'm grateful. So, well, thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. So, Enrique, thank you so much. And on your way out, I encourage all of you to take a look at this new book. Now that you've heard from Enrique, you can take him home with you. Some really brilliant little wonderful blurbs. Hold on. There we go. Short blurbs. Good thinking. It's absolutely delightful. And I'm so pleased to say it's called On Art and Mindfulness, Notes from the Anderson Ranch. So thank you again, Enrique. Thank you. <laughs>